What if I told you that forensic science isn't always the open and shut case that we might think it is? It might not surprise you if I told you that later tonight you might have left a hair, a fibre, maybe even your DNA on that seat after you've got up. But what if the person who sits on that seat next, they pick up that hair or that fibre? Ordinarily, that's not a problem. But what if they go off to commit a crime, they leave a trace of you at that crime scene, and you become the prime suspect? <laughs> <laughs> at this point, you might be thinking, isn't that exactly what forensic science is for? Isn't that what it does? Isn't that what we see on shows like CSI? The team follow the evidence, they identify the suspect, and then they close the case. Not all of us are going to commit a crime, but every single one of us could be accused of one. So imagine you're standing in the court, and the expert is explaining to the judge how that hair, that fibre, how your DNA is cast iron proof of your guilt. But you know you're innocent. But you know it's you versus science. Now we know that there are lots of people out there who don't have to imagine this because it's happened. But the thing is, it is still happening. So how have we got here? Forensic science is undoubtedly a technological success story. We can now identify smaller and smaller traces of material. We can do it more and more accurately, and we can do it quicker than ever before. You've only got to be in this room a minute, just speaking, and the technology can pick up your DNA, maybe on that seat in front of you. But forensic science has got a problem. It's a problem that's gone under the radar. And it's a problem that has the potential to impact thousands of innocent people. In 2015, the FBI did a study. They looked at 268 cases where hair evidence was used to incriminate a suspect. And what they found was that in 257 of those cases, erroneous statements were made. That's 96%. In 96% of the cases, the forensic evidence was misinterpreted. And we've seen a similar issue for other forensic evidence types in our studies in the UK. What that 96% is telling us is that the forensic science has got a problem that technology alone can't fix. What we really need to know is that if we find your uh, DNA on a weapon or gunshot residue on you, how did it get there, and when did it get there? And the issue is, at the moment, we don't have the data that we need to be able to answer that question sufficiently. This really came home for me a number of years ago. I was working through a case file, it was a murder case, and I got to the judges summing up, and I can only really describe it to you as you know, that ice in the pit of your stomach moment. There was some critical forensic evidence in that case, and an assumption was made about how that evidence was transferred and when it was transferred. That was then presented to the court as a fact, and it led to the conviction of two men for a crime that they didn't commit. Misinterpretation of forensic evidence is the biggest challenge facing forensic science. And so that's exactly the focus of what the research team that I lead at University College London is aiming to do. We want to do those studies that will get us the data that will mean we can begin to answer these questions of how and when. So an example. We got a volunteer to fire a gun. And we got that volunteer to then shake hands with a colleague, and then that colleague got on with his day-to-day -day activities. And what we observed was that that colleague not only had gunshot residue on them, he hadn't fired a gun, but he was also able to transfer that res residue onto other people and onto other things. So what does that mean? Did anybody get a taxi here tonight? It is possible that you could now test positive for gunshot residue. It would be because you do have gunshot residue on you, but it might not be because you fired a gun recently. It could be that you happen to hail that particular taxi, you open the door, you sat down, you got the belt, and you managed to pick up some gunshot residue that was already there. That is a very important distinction. We're also looking at trace DNA, how that transfers and how it moves. And our studies are showing that it is possible to identify the DNA profile of somebody who's handled a knife on that knife. Probably no great surprise. But what we are also beginning to see in our studies is that it is possible for somebody else 
to transfer your DNA onto a knife, but it is a knife that you have never touched. That is very important to know, especially if you're in the dock and you're innocent. So forensic science isn't always the open and shut case that we might think it is. It is possible that we could find your DNA on a, on a jacket or some clothing that you've never worn. It is possible that you could test positive for gunshot residue as you go through the airport scanner because you got a taxi to the airport. But at the moment, we don't have the data that we need to understand how and when that happens. And that means that forensic science evidence isn't always going to be interpreted accurately. So we need a change. We need a change from having our primary focus being focused on what something is and who it belongs to, and we need to get serious about getting the answers we need to the how and the when. If we can do that, we have got the opportunity to dramatically reduce the chances of evidence being misinterpreted. We need to do that so that you never have to be that innocent person in the dock. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. You know, her talk had so much amazing, dense information that we had to ask a question. So <laughs> I have a follow-up question for you, which is, you founded the Center for Forensic Sciences at the University College of London. So how did that happen? How did you get there? Sure. It was that case. Um, that case that I mentioned, it really showed me that we've got so many gaps in our knowledge and that those gaps matter because they impact real people. Um, and I also saw in that case that research had an incredibly opportune way of helping fill those gaps. So, um, wonderful colleagues at University College London supported my vision. I set up the centre and we've now got... We're, we're doing loads of research into these questions, but what we're seeing is so many more questions. Um, so I'm so excited to be able to share this story with you because um, the more people who know about it, the more momentum we can get and then we can really make sure that we get those answers and make those changes. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.